Aloha, and thanks for listening to the Why Hypnosis Podcast, promoting quality hypnosis and NLP education on the islands of Hawaii, where I interview the top hypnotists, hypnotherapists, and NLP practitioners in the world so that you can learn their secrets to create positive changes in your life and the lives of others. You can subscribe to the Hawaii Hypnosis Newsletter at www.hawaiihypnosis.org. You will receive subscriber-only content such as free contests, articles to help you learn hypnosis and NLP, updates on upcoming hypnosis slash NLP trainings in Hawaii, plus an exclusive hypnosis audio that is only available to the newsletter subscribers. Thanks for listening. Aloha, folks. This is Antonio Perez with HawaiiHypnosis.org. Now, today I've got somebody on the podcast. It's taking me a very long time to get them, just um, conflicting time zones and whatnot. My guest for today is James Tripp, the creator of the Hypnosis Without Trance protocol from HypnosisWithoutTrance.com. James, thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you for having me, Antonio. It's, uh, it's good to finally get to talk after several attempts. Probably about a year, I think. Probably, yeah, something like that, yeah. Hopefully it won't take me another year to get this thing edited. <laughs> Aloha, this is Antonio Perez with HawaiiHypnosis.org. I'm going to take a small break in the podcast, ask you for a small favor. Now, if you look up, see the subscribe button, go ahead and click subscribe, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. You get instant access to all the upcoming podcasts, free teleseminars, and contests. How did you get into the hypnosis arts? Well, um, I've been I've been messing around with hypnosis since 2002, so that's about 10 years now, I guess. And uh, people have often asked this question. I'd love to have a really, really great, really cool story about something quirky. But um, the truth is I saw Darren Brown on telly uh, just after his first TV specials in, in the UK, and he was on a chat show. And... I just watched him and he blew my mind and I thought, whatever that guy is doing, I want to know how to do that and I want to be able to do that. So that was the point that I seriously got into finding out about hypnosis, finding out about NLP. I also got into finding out about mentalism uh, stuff as well and was performing that for a long time. So that's, that's kind of how I got into it. It wasn't, however, my first experience with hypnosis. I'd say my first experience with hypnosis was in about 19... 98 probably in um in a chinese martial arts class but it was not called hypnosis it was a demonstration of empty force moving somebody with the power of chi uh but looking back and i i figured this out at the time anyway i don't really think it was chi at all that was moving people about or moving me about um it was suggestion it was pure suggestion it was pure uh, hypnosis really and um, and I even had that suspicion at the time I remember asking the instructor I said you know is this is this really for real or is it like hypnosis or some kind of suggestion thing and he said to me at the time well it's similar in that hypnosis uses chi of the mind and what he was doing used the chi of the body which was total total nonsense I'm sure but um, but he was a good hypnotist you know, whatever he called what he was doing, he was a good hypnotist. And I would say that was my first experience with hypnosis, uh, although I didn't start doing it until about 2002. I think we've talked before, um, just chatting before about um, Chi and everything. I think we have uh, um, different views on it. That would be that'd be another like three hour long podcast right there. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But, um, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that that uh, I'm not saying anything about chi when I say that. What I'm saying is what that guy was demonstrating under the guise of a chi manipulation was, I'm sure, a pure suggestion-based thing. Um, I don't think, you know, I, I'm not really a big believer in the kind of whole empty force thing. There's a very interesting clip being doing a, a, the rounds on uh, YouTube of an empty force master knocking over 100 students before going in to face off uh, some hard martial artist who just basically kicks the kicks the sense out of him i, I know exactly uh, what clip you're talking about yeah yeah you know so i'm i'm not saying you know there's uh, uh there's no such thing as chi or anything i'm just saying a lot of what does masquerade as chi work is uh, it's hard to pull out what suggestion and what's not um with a lot of that stuff aloha this is antonio again now asking for another small favor you just scroll below this video 
see the like button, go ahead and click like and scroll a little bit farther and go ahead and just put a uh, comment in. Let me know what you think about this video. Hypnosis without trance. Mm. What exactly is it? Okay, for a start, hypnosis without trance is not a new style of hypnosis or a new form of hypnosis. Um, as some people have said, oh, this isn't new. This is no, it isn't new. It's hypnosis. Uh, if anything, it's a way of thinking about hypnosis and a way of approaching hypnosis. Classically, hypnosis is explained as a special state, an altered state, a specific altered state that renders people more open to suggestion. Now, in playing around with hypnosis with clients over the years and then more specifically taking hypnosis out into impromptu situations, what I found was that when it came to what were often called deep trance phenomena, there were plenty of people who could do deep trance phenomena in apparently an everyday waking state of consciousness. And there are other people that you could do a trance induction on, really, you know, put them into a, what looked like, if you look at all the trance analogs, looked like a very deep state of trance. We get very little happening in terms of uh, what are often called deep trance phenomena. So I, I started to see where there was no correlation between these states that the trance inductions were supposed to be putting people into and the, their ability to manifest um, phenomena. And more specifically, I often found that deep trance hindered the manifestation of phenomena. And when I shifted my mindset away from putting somebody into a trance so as to give them suggestions and shifted it into, well, you know, what's the experience I want to take them directly into? And just started to utilize uh, language and communication skills to take them directly into that experience, bypassing all the trance stuff, uh, I found that the results got a lot better. Now, my belief about hypnosis is that it works simply by engaging people's cognitive processes that are operating all the time. Um, and I don't think they need a special state to do it. I think they need to be focused. I think they need to engage in a process, but I don't think they need to be in a special state particularly. So my belief is that hypnosis is not reliant upon a special state called trance. And it's also my belief, and I, I think I'm going to take this opportunity to make this clear, that from my perspective, even hypnosis that does utilize trance inductions is hypnosis without trance in a funny kind of way, in that it's not the trance, it's not the special state, I believe, that's making the hypnosis happen. That was kind of a hard one to wrap my head around. Put it this way. Here's, here's one way of thinking about it. Um, when we're asleep, when we're dreaming, we, we create and perceive at the same time. They talk about this in the movie Inception, and uh, my friend Jamie Smart talks about this in some of the talks that he does. But people create and perceive at the same time. The dreams we dream are being created by us, and they are being perceived by us. So we have that capacity within our neurology to create and perceive. When we're awake, we're doing exactly the same thing. It's just that we have an input, a live feed input through our senses. So we have data streaming in through our eyes. We have data streaming in through our ears. And it gets organized by that ongoing process of creation and perception. So when we, um, when we see something, it's not that we're actually seeing that thing. We are getting a lot of data coming in through our eyes and our brains are organizing it into the experience we have. So we have this cognitive faculty for creating and shaping reality that runs all the time. Uh, and it runs in an everyday waking state of consciousness. And there's a quote from a guy called John Eccles, which goes something like this. Uh, he's, a, he's a neuroscientist. Um, and it goes something like this. There is no color in the world. And there is no beauty and there is no ugliness. Out there, beyond the limits of our perceptual apparatus, is an erratically ambiguous and ceaselessly flowing quantum soup. And we are almost like magicians in that we take that soup and turn it into our experience of reality in an ordinary, everyday waking state of consciousness. Um, I know that almost verbatim. I probably got one or two words wrong because I use it a lot in my training. But it's this sense that... If you listen to uh, if you listen to what this guy is saying, this neuroscientist, in an ordinary everyday waking state of consciousness, we take that and turn it into our experience of reality. 
And I think that that's the real magic of hypnosis is that as human beings, we can and we do shape our reality all the time. And as hypnotists, what we're doing with people is not really taking them into a trance and giving them suggestions as such. It's tapping into these cognitive processes that people are running all the time to shape their reality and figuring out how we can influence them. That's how I see hypnosis. When you're talking about using language in a specific way, does that include any of the uh, clean language model? Yeah, absolutely. All of that stuff I've just said about hypnosis without trance, that's that's a view on one level. On another level, you could say that the hip- hypnosis without trance is simply this, my style of hypnosis. It's simply how James Tripp does hypnosis and how James Tripp thinks about hypnosis. It's not right or it's wrong. It's just the way I do it and the way I think about it. When it comes to the way I do hypnosis, there are a number of uh, strong influences on me. The first of which is NLP and specifically the NLP Milton model. So the Milton Erickson stuff, very, very strong influence. The second strong influence is classic direct hypnosis. Um, And I have to credit Anthony Jacquin, who people may know, and his dad, Freddie Jacquin, for um, for teaching me that stuff. So there's that plus the Ericksonian stuff, plus clean language, David Grove stuff. So you mentioned clean language. That is there's a lot from clean language that influences how I do hypnosis. Jonathan Chase, he wants to know who all trained you. Okay, who trained me? Who trained me? I guess originally I was trained by some NLP trainers, but overall I've trained with an awful lot of people. There's a bio somewhere, I think, on my old site. I don't know if it's still available. Uh, I've trained with Bandler. I've trained with McKenna, uh, John Laval, um, John Grinder. Originally I've trained with Melody and Joe Cheel. Trained in clean language with Wendy Sullivan, James Lawley, Penny Tompkin, uh, Anthony Jackwin, Freddie Jackwin in direct hypnosis. Norman Vorton um, in clean language and also in idiodynamic work, Ernest Ross's idiodynamic work with Norman Vorton. Um, trained with Andy Austin, trained with Nick Kemp, uh, trained with Frank Puslick. Um, I've trained with a lot of people overall. Wow, it's pretty, uh, a pretty broad range. So, um... Yeah. The thing I'll say about training, though, is... I think training is good. Training is important. I love training. I still train with people and I probably always will because I love this stuff. I love hypnosis. I love um, the broader uh, the broader field of human beings, human dynamics, human psychology. I love all of that stuff. So I continue to train. Uh, I've already been on uh, one training this year and have some others that I intend to be going on. So I love training and I really think it's an important thing. But I think more important than training is what you do is that you take the things that you're learning out into the real world and you find contexts in which to um, to develop them, to practice them. So for me, while I have trained with many, many people, much of what I've kind of learned and figured out has come from doing hypnosis, from doing street hypnosis, and also um, when I was performing as a mentalist. So a lot of the hypnosis stuff overlaps with the mentalism stuff. In addition to that, there's all the coaching and change work that I've been doing for about six years now. And also, to a great extent, when I was teaching martial arts, there's a a big, a lot of use of conversational hypnosis in that context. So I always encourage people, yes, go on trainings, but what's more important is taking charge of your own learning and your own education. And when people ask me who taught me, the answer, and this may sound arrogant, but the answer is always me. I taught me because I took charge of my own learning. Now, that isn't to undervalue all the input that I've had from my various teachers and mentors and and this sort of thing. I totally value that. And I think it's an important thing, but I think anybody who wants to learn and learn effectively needs to step up and take charge of their own learning. That's not arrogant in the least bit. Before you said it was um, yourself that taught you, I knew exactly where where you were going. You can go to training. So if you have a closed mind, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think everybody I know who's really, really good at this stuff. And I want to say um, there are people I know who are excellent hypnotists who have got virtually no training at all. Um, You know, they've been on they've been on one weekend workshop or been on no workshops at all. They've just gone out there and done it. And because they've they've been willing to go out and they've been willing to experiment and they've been willing to play with what they've learned, what they've read in books. They've ended up becoming really, really good without 
necessarily having to go on any formal courses or anything. So there are many, many ways to learn this stuff and many ways to get good. But the common denominator is always taking charge of your own learning. I'm wondering what you think about the head hackers AI model or the automatic imagination model. Um, I can't. So in a way, I'm not too familiar with it. Now, I know Anthony and I know Kev, and we've had lots of conversations about AI, um, particularly when they were developing it. But since it's been developed and it's been on the market and there's, I can't think what the audio is called, ripped apart, I think it's called. Yeah, ripped apart, uh, the automatic imagination model, I believe. Yeah, I haven't had the opportunity to listen to that. From the conversations that I have with Anthony and Kev, I actually think it's quite a good model for doing hypnosis from what I understood of it. And I may be getting it completely wrong because I may, I haven't heard the final, um, the final product. It seemed like a very, very good model for doing hypnosis. And I can see how it would really work well in guiding a hypnotist and getting hypnotic phenomena happening as an explanation for hypnosis. I'm not quite sold on it as an explanation for, uh, being how hypnosis works. So, so on the one hand, on the practical sense, I think it's excellent as an explanatory theory. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it quite it's, it certainly doesn't satisfy uh, my mind and it doesn't tally up with all of the experiences I've had regarding hypnosis myself. But I think it's, it's not far off in some ways. Once in a while, I get people asking me about what I think about the state versus no state, um, this model versus that model. Honestly, I tell them I'm like, I really don't care. As mm. long as as long as it works, I know hypnosis is out there. It works, I, so mm. I really don't try to lock myself down to any particular model. Yeah, which I think is good. I think it's a, a really good thing to keep an open mind. And one of the things I was just saying in a conversation to my good friend John Morgan earlier today: if you get stuck in one way of thinking about something, it ultimately always creates problems. And having the ability to think about things in different ways and not think, well, this is the truth. Because, I mean, I, you know, I don't pretend at any point to know the truth about hypnosis. There are some people out there who are absolutely sure they know the truth about hypnosis. But I don't see it as that. I see it as a bunch of models. So ultimately, you look at the model and think, well, here's one way of looking at hypnosis. When I look at it this way, what does it get me that's good and how does it hold me back? And when I look at it this way, what does it get me that's good and how does it hold me back? So different models work in different ways. And they often, you know, some models work very, very effectively for a certain type of hypnotic subject. If you operate by a certain model and do hypnosis a certain way, it will be very effective with a certain type of hypnotic subject. Somebody else needs a different approach. So I think flexibility and, and being able to shift perspectives is a very useful thing. In regards to keeping an open mind, Hypno I mean if you're if you're interested in hypnosis, you should have an open mind. And well the reason I'm the reason I'm in hypnosis is when I was uh, younger I found Dave Elman's hypnotherapy book. I think it was six, mm. maybe seven, and I remember I was trying to hypnotize my stuffed animals when I was <laughs> that young. And regardless, yeah. every one of my stuffed animals was a somnambulist. Just sat there and mm. did nothing. Mm. Their eyes went all glassy. <laughs> exactly. And I think they are still glassy to this day if they haven't made it to the uh, compost pile. Yeah, I think it's um, you know I think it's it's good to keep an open mind. And you know we were talking earlier about trainers and and that sort of thing. I think reading is important as well um, because it exposes you to different models. Or at least if you're not a reader, I know some people are not big readers, and that's that's a fine thing. That's that's fair enough. But I think it's good to find information in place and get exposed to different models and different ways of thinking about it and not necessarily be too hung, hung up on finding the truth about hypnosis, but finding a way of thinking about hypnosis and a way of doing hypnosis that works for you. Anthony Jackwin, he wants me to ask you what quantitative difference have you noticed when your therapeutic work since you've taken trance out of everything? Um, that's an interesting thing with therapeutic work because the way I do therapeutic work now or, or change work um, is I don't even know there are there are people that would say it's not even hypnosis now I think there are strong elements of hypnosis in what I do but other people would think that that wasn't the case uh, I'm happy to use hypnosis to the way I think about hypnosis is it as the use of language and communication to direct attention 
and seed ideas for the purpose of leading somebody into an altered perception of reality. And that's altered from wherever they are. So it's just directing their mind. It's directing their experience. Um, when I work with clients, I work a lot at utilizing their consciousness, not necessarily trying to bypass it, but directing their consciousness using language and seeing particular ideas. So they pay attention to the structures of their uh, problems, if you like, if you want to use that term, in different ways. And as they pay attention to them, they loosen off and open up new feedback loops, which then are able to transform them. Um, I know that's a very abstract description, but if I'm putting it quickly, that's the best way I can do it. What I've found now is the way I work now. Now I pay attention to real time feedback. And this is the thing that's important. I like to work without trance because I like to work in a perpetual feedback loop with the client. And I like to maximize the amount of feedback I'm getting from them. With eyes closed, sort of sleep deeper and deeper stuff. Uh, to me, it starts to shut off a lot of feedback channels. And it becomes more challenging to run an experience for somebody in real time and to know they're following along. A lot of people who get into hypnotherapy, they sit there putting the client into trance and going along and they're thinking, I have no idea whether this person is going where I want them to go. So I like to have a real time feedback loop. From that perspective, I think that since removing trance, removing that way of working, my efficacy with clients has increased massively. And I do follow up with clients whenever, um, I don't always follow up, but when I don't follow up, it's because I'm disorganized. Uh, so occasionally a client will slip through the net. But as a rule, I follow up with clients and make sure I find out what's happening for them. Most hypnotherapists do not do this, at least, you know, when I've when I've had discussions with people about it. An awful lot of hypnotherapists do not do this. They do their whiz bang trance thing. Uh, the client looks all glowing and warm at the end of the session and they say, that's it. They cooked. And when the question is, well, how do you know? The answer is usually, well, they didn't come back and complain. Well, I don't think that's really good enough. I think it's worth paying attention to feedback, following up the clients. So I always say to the clients, you know, if it's good with you, I'm going to check in with you because I'd love to get your story of what's been happening for you. Um, that's how I'll check in. So I check in with clients. And my opinion is the way I work now is the best way I've ever worked. And for some people, very occasionally, I would still do classic trance work because that's exactly what they need. I still do it very occasionally, and I did somebody. Uh, I did work with somebody recently, who I ended up doing a very kind of classic trance session with, and that's just the way it kind of rolled out and folded out because that was the best way for that person to work because they didn't want to go places consciously. There were certain places they weren't willing to go, so I had to work in a different way. Let's say uh, if somebody doesn't come back. Yeah. I guess there's two ways of looking at it. One, as you said, saying, "Okay, cool, everything's taken care of." Mm. The other. The other way of looking at it is they might have a um, the kind of buyer's remorse saying, hey, it didn't work. I'm not going to I'm not, I, I don't want to go back and hassle them or have them try to give try to buy me into more sessions. Yeah, it could be that it could be they just shrug it off and say, well, you know, I guess it didn't work. The thing is, I talk about this stuff a lot. So I get a lot of people contact me and they say, um, you know, you know, they say, I went to see a hypnotherapist and it didn't really work out. And they never went back. And the reasons they didn't go back are often, well, it just didn't work. There's no, no point. They don't want to go back and get into an argument with it. It's like most people, if they don't, at least maybe this is an English thing, a very English thing. But people sit in restaurants that eat a lousy meal. They'll complain about it to their friends. And then the waitress comes over and says, is everything OK with your meal? And they say, yes, fine. Um. And it's only a minority of people that actually say, no, the steak is really tough. It's really horrible. And the, and the potatoes are hard. There's only a small number of people that are willing to do that because oftentimes people like to avoid conflict. And here's the interesting thing. Um, I'm going to stick my neck out here and say something controversial. <clears throat> and a lot of people are probably going to get upset with me for saying this. Uh, or maybe not. Who knows? I think especially with really hardcore direct hypno hypnosis, what I call power hypnosis. I think, first of all, with that kind of hypnosis, instantly there are certain people that bristle against that anyway, and they never become clients of hypnotists like that. So that's the first thing. People who do, people who are willing to be dominated in a hypnosis session and by a hypnotist in a very kind of domineering way are not usually the sort of people that, that, pipe up and say, um, excuse me, 
I, uh, I, I've got a complaint to make about the session that it hasn't worked. So I think that there can be a tendency often with, if there's a very domineering approach used to filter out the kind of clients who would come back and say, uh, no, this hasn't worked. Um, and I know that's a controversial thing to say, and I know there'll be people listening to this who will probably boil totally uh, in rage as I say that. But you might get right. you might get some hate mail. I might do, yeah. But I thought you know maybe I'll say it anyway because because I do believe it's true as well. I think this is this is the thing about looking at hypnosis and all of this kind of stuff. As much as anything, it's about the kind of it's about the human dynamics. It's about how do people behave, and and status play is a massive thing. In hypnosis, particularly classic hypnosis, who is it? Is it um, the, there's the old school conception of hypnosis that it's about a prestige faith relationship. And if you listen to that prestige faith, the hypnotist has prestige, the hypnotee has faith. It's a status dynamic that's going on there. It's a status dynamic. And when people turn themselves over to be. Um, to be basically run by another person, that's a very powerful thing. They open themselves up, they become very vulnerable at that point. Uh, and to then turn around and say, hang on a second, boom, they have to take that power dynamic back. And that's not always an easy thing for, for most human beings to do, to make those kind of status shifts, those those shifts in dynamic easily. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And uh, if you don't mind me saying... Let's say if you had a – this brought up an interesting point in my head. What if you have a um, a client who's in a really um, bad relationship, the husband's very domineering? It's mm. almost like you're just reinforcing that. If you come from a very domineering uh, hypnotist mentality, it's almost like you're reinforcing her problems even though you're trying to help her. Yes, and I'm going to say something which is going to sound like I'm going against what I just said. I think some people who are um, – what Keith Johnstone, the impro teacher, would call habitual low status players. A habitual low status player will not work well with an Ericksonian style induction because they're waiting to be led. They're waiting to be dominated. And with with people who operate from that kind of place, um, in a way, to work with them, the trick is to actually do what they need, which is to dominate them, but to use it as a pace to lead them, to begin to be uh, quite domineering and quite directive, um, or maybe being dominant without being domineering, to use a term from uh, Ross Jeffries, strangely enough, but to be quite dominant to begin with, but then to lead them to a place where they become more empowered, where they're more stepping up um, and taking a higher kind of status position themselves. There's a certain there's a certain art to playing the dynamics. Um, this kind of stuff fascinates me because I spent a lot of time interacting with human beings across lots of different contexts and looking at influence and persuasion stuff. And I think the, the one size fits all kind of approach of, yes, we do this one induction. I think if you have one induction that you mainly do or one style of induction, maybe you have a few, but they're all the same style. What you tend to get is one sort of client. Um, but if you open yourself up and you're willing to take a broader range of clients, you often find that you need to have more flexibility about how you work. Like everything I just said about, yes, I don't really use trance. I don't have a preference um, or trance work. I don't have a preference. But sometimes that's what needs to happen for the client, that particular particular client, because of the way the, the variables are coming together. That's the approach that fits them. Yeah, like you said, it's all about flexibility. Yeah. Which can be a hard thing for people coming into the uh, into the field. It can be a very, very hard thing. Uh, and it can be a hard thing sometimes for people who have been doing it the same way for years and don't necessarily want to open themselves up to new ways of doing things. But especially for people coming into the field, it can be a difficult thing because you can't just pick up that flexibility in one weekend. You have to pick up what you can pick up. You have to start simple. Everybody has to start simple. Um and it's through having more and more experience that you develop a greater level of skill and flexibility through ongoing learning. I always think about this in terms of what I call the path of mastery, not the path to mastery, the path of mastery. It's the path itself that is the, the process of mastery. It's engaging. It's 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 doing your 10,000 hours, but you're never really there. You never really get there. You just 
sort of get better and better and better. There are diminishing returns as you go further up the curve. But there's always something you can learn if you're open minded. There's always there's always a new situation to be encountered that you may not have encountered yet um, and a greater sort of range of flexibility to open up within yourself. So for me, this stuff's always about a learning journey. And if I ever got to the point where I just thought, yeah, uh, I'm good enough at this now, um, I'd probably get bored of it and stop doing it. But as long as it's interesting and fascinating and, and there's more to discover, for me, that's what keeps me going, not doing the same, the same thing over and over again. You, you got to keep it interesting. That's one reason why um, I interview uh, so many different change workers. Mm. Is I like to he- like get a different um, viewpoint all the time. It's good. Just mix it up, get different perspectives, different ideas, uh, and go out there and play with stuff. That's the way to do it. Anthony Jacqueline wants to know, whose recent contributions to the field do you value a little more? Would it be Bandler or Grinders? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Okay. Um, could I have none of the above on that? Which uh, I don't want to be mean about about uh, Banner and Grinder, but um, I disagree with those guys on a lot of points. And I, I really totally respect everything that they've done. I suppose I'd have to go. I love the way Grinder thinks. I love to listen to John Grinder think. That's something that Frank Puselik said, that it's always a joy to listen to John Grinder speak, because when you do, you listen to John Grinder think. Uh, but actually, I, I like, I probably like Bandler stuff better, ultimately. I think, uh, I think I've got more use out of it. I've played around with, and I like utilizing consciousness. I think as human beings, we are whole we are whole beings. That means we have mind, we have consciousness. I prefer to work when I work with somebody to work with them in their totality, not to try and slew bits off. And I think that John Grinder's approach being very much orientated towards get the consciousness out of the way and, and work directly with non-conscious processes. I think there's value to that, but I think it's one sided. I like to work with a, a whole approach. Richard Bandler is more willing to work with consciousness. I don't necessarily like the way he works with consciousness. If I was going to say who I think is, is really made a difference to me, it would be Eugene Gendlin with his focusing. Uh, it would be um, David Grove and all of clean language. And um, I have to say Jurgen Rasmussen, um, because I get, uh, fortunately, I'm pretty good friends with Jürgen now and I get to speak to him a lot on Skype and just speaking to that guy as an education. He is, he is a phenomenally insightful uh, individual and he is always experimenting and always learning and always playing with new ideas. So I, I find I could look at Banner, I could look at Grinder. I, I'd rather spend time with Jürgen. Uh, I think I'd learn more from him than, than the pair of them. He, he's a fantastically bright guy and he has an ability to think things through and see nuances that a lot of people miss. So he, he's he's a smart guy, and if anybody you know if anyone's listening to this ever gets the opportunity to train with him, I strongly recommend taking that opportunity. Yeah, I'm gonna have to convince him to take a vacation out here pretty soon. Yeah, it would be well worth it if you can get him over. It would be well worth well worth it. James, how many products you have? Uh, I have I have three products currently. Um, I've got another one which is kind of in development, but. I'm a disorganized kind of a character, so it can take me quite a long time. I have the Hypnosis Without Trance Hypnosis Mastery Program, which is my kind of foundational thing, uh, which was originally a CD and DVD set, 10 discs in total, but now is, is most people get it via instant download. Uh, and at some point, I'm going to update the whole thing and re-release it uh, when I finally get around to it. I also have the no fail protocol, which I'm also going to update and re-release at some point, but probably not within the next year. Um, and that's about flexibility. It's about utilizing what happens, but it's about where Ericksonians often talk about utilization. They don't necessarily have a system for doing it. Uh, whereas the no fail protocol is really a system for utilizing and looking at uh, what I would call no fail maneuvers looking at the critical points within any hypnosis process where it could go the direction you don't want it to go in and knowing how, if it goes in that direction, how to roll with it and take it back on track towards something useful. Uh, that's the no-fail protocol. The other one is, is just change work applications, which is using 
some of the stuff learned from the first set, the hypnosis mastery program, and looking at that in the context of change work and covering in addition to that some change work principles as well. So I have those three things. At the moment, uh, by the time people are listening to this, I will have a whole new resource area on www.hypnosiswithouttrance.com with over 70 videos teaching different aspects of hypnosis and hypnosis without trance, including a 17-part course called How to Hypnotize Without Trance, and that's all totally free, along with a, a mentoring and support forum on there as well, and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So that's probably the first place to look is at all the free stuff at www.hypnosiswithouttrance.com. The videos, are they uh, YouTube videos that you embedded? Yeah, they're, they're mostly um, they're YouTube videos, uh, so, I mean, you can find them all on YouTube, but when they're embedded within the resource area, they're organized into sequences and they also have accompanying notes with them. And they're, you know, they have a navigation so you can, you can find your way around them rather than just trawling through my YouTube channel, which many people have done in the past, but not everybody has the patience to do. There's also a bunch of audios on there as well uh, with, hip, with conversations with, uh, with some, some very interesting hypnotists, including Jürgen, who I've, I've just been singing the praises of just now. One of my favorite parts in his book was the uh, Mr. I Can't Piss in Public bit. Definitely had me laughing. Mm. Yeah, and, and also the, for people reading Jürgen's book, there's a lot more to him than that book. People look at that book and they think that he's, that he's all about kind of busting people's backsides and things. But um, he, he has a, a very, very rich uh, range of, of approaches and applications that he utilizes. So he's not always there doing that hardcore provocative stuff. Yeah, he seems really flexible. Like if he needs to be real provocative to shake you out of your, uh, out of uh, out of your problem or to gently coax you out of a problem, it seems like he could be, um, he could go either way. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, James, uh, I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time to um, to chat with me today. It's, You're more than welcome. It's been fun. You know, it's always nice when you actually finally do get a chance to have an in-depth conversation where how you can you learn that much more about a person. Like, I didn't know that you had trained with as many people that you have trained with. I'm, I'm still only scratching the surface of the names I can remember uh, off the top, but um, I do have a full training bio somewhere. I'll put it up at some point. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out. And yeah, uh, for everybody listening, how um, what is your training schedule for the next year? So if anybody wants to uh, train with you, um, yeah, I may have mentioned. Did I mention that I'm totally disorganized as a human being? Um, yes. Yeah, okay, that's good. So at the moment, I don't, I've just, just done a London workshop a couple of weeks ago, uh, for Hypnosis Without Trance, Hypnosis Wizardry Life. I have a training I'm running in Melbourne, in Australia, in October. Um, other than that, I don't have any workshops as yet booked for this year because I'm kind of deciding what I want to do. Um, in a way, what I want to do is, uh, I want to do more change work workshops, which I'm not really geared up to be promoting through the Hypnosis Without Trance website. So that's the reason they haven't been scheduled in. And I'm looking at setting up and getting some buzz going around that and then scheduling some change work workshops in. Because uh, as fun as the hypnotic phenomena stuff is, um, for me, it doesn't have the same depth of meaning as being able to utilize these technologies, if you will, to be able to help people make profound changes in their lives. For me, that's a really, really rewarding thing to do, uh, to be able to do and to teach people to do more so than, say, teaching people to stick people to things or do amnesias or hallucinations and that kind of thing. So I'm probably going to be doing more change work workshops this year. And when if people pay attention to the website, uh, which, again, to gratuitously plug it, is www.hypnosiswithouttrance.com. If people pay attention to what's going on there, they will uh, find out what's happening training-wise. And if you're in Australia, I'll be I'll be in Melbourne in October. And I take it you're probably going to – is um, James sponsoring that? James Sakalos? Yeah. Yes, he is. Do you know James? Yeah, I did an interview with him. He's very um very cool guy. He is a cool guy. Um He's uh, he's another smart guy who I enjoy spending uh, spending time on Skype chatting to. He's got a lot of interesting perspectives and insights. 
Yeah, definitely a very, uh, very smart guy. Mm. Cool. Thank you very much, man. You're more than welcome. It's, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Finally get the opportunity to do so. It's only been, I think, maybe a year. Hopefully it won't take me too long to get this edited. Yeah.